Hi, I'm Mr. Baker, and this is your 10.1 and 10.2 Introduction to Evolution, the History of Life. 10.1 is talking about the fossil evidence of chains, and we're going to explain and provide examples for various types of evidence that supports evolution, including fossils. You have to go back and look at Earth's early history. Earth is considered to be 4.6 billion years old. Land? There was no land. It was a literal case of the floor is lava, and there were volcanoes everywhere, and it was super hot. The atmosphere was full of the volcanic gases that were spewing out of these volcanoes, including uh, water vapor, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, HCN, straight into and straight H2. And if you went back in a time machine, uh, there was no free oxygen, no O2 in the air. You'd asphyxiate, so don't accept a uh, ride from a time traveler. The first instance of life is uh, recorded 3.5 billion years ago, and that is our first fossil evidence of life. Any living thing can form a fossil, but most decompose before they can fossilize. And is this a picture of the earliest fossil? And there's some debate as to whether that is an actual thing called a stromatolite, which is a sign of uh, bacteria living, or whether it's just a chemical process like rust. However, most of the evidence suggests that that is an actual stromatolite from 3.5 billion years ago. Here are some living stromatolites on the top from Shark Bay, Australia. And they are mounds of bacteria that catch uh, sand and then they migrate to the top and so they they grow very slowly over a long period of time. The bottom are fossils from Great Slave Lake in Canada and you can see that there are the striations of the bacteria, sorry, the remnants of the bacterial growth. Other forms of fossils includes petrified wood, here is an actual shell, here is a insect trapped in amber. Here are tracks of a fossilized, or fossilized tracks of some animal. Well, if you find a fossil, then you got to figure out how old it is. And over time, layers of rock form, and the younger layers of rock are deposited on top of the older layers. This is called sedimentary rock. I believe this picture is from the Grand Canyon in the U.S., and the younger layers on top of the older layers. Relative dating is, hey, if I find it in this layer of rock that we've already identified as 550 million years old, this fossil is probably 550 million years old. So you track it to where it's found. And again, the deeper you go, the older the fossils are. Another piece of evidence can help is called radiometric dating. You have two options here, uranium-238 uranium or U-238 or carbon-14. U-238 is good for all of Earth's history. Carbon-14, you'll go back to about 50,000 years ago, and then it's uh, rendered not uh, important. Geologic time scales are broken up by geologists. They have reasons for breaking these into various things. You need to know that an era is hundreds of millions of years, a period is tens of millions of years, and an epoch is a few million years. Here is the actual uh, geologic time, time scale coming out of the Geologic Society of America, and that is a whole lot of things to memorize. So we're not going to memorize it, but realize that it's there. There are a few important events in the history of the Earth that we do want you to know. One of them is a signature event called the Cambrian Explosion. This signifies the first life on land, and it is heralded at 550 million years ago in the fossil record. Before that was called the Precambrian time. That's 90% of the history of the Earth. And the first life is in the oceans, so there was no life on land. So the Cambrian explosion, first off, there wasn't much that was able to be saved in the fossil record. And then all of a sudden, there is a multitude of fossils. And you got your first land animals. That's the Cambrian explosion 550 million years ago. The Mesozoic era is the era of the dinosaurs with the periods Triassic, Triassic Jurassic, and Cretaceous in it, and this is where mammals first appear. Ballpark about 160 million years ago, and they resembled modern day shrews. And here's a picture of a shrew. And here's your fun fact, some shrews will have purple teeth due to the iron in their diets. The first shrew, and it looks different than what we have, uh, they had long tails. Just so you know that the skinny shrew is the oldest true mammal, and that's from uh, an actual article. 
you need to be aware of things called mass extinction events, and where it's at least half of all species disappear. It generally results in a new geologic era beginning, and here you say, uh, that's a graph showing the dips, and there was a huge one at the Permian, and this coincides, if I'm not mistaken, with the breakup of Pangaea. All kinds of volcanoes going off, and it was really harsh for life, but it wiped out a whole bunch, but those that left, were left behind were the ones that then seeded the new forms of life that we're familiar with today. A big one that's important to us because it allowed for the rise of the mammals was the KT boundary. That's the Cretaceous Tertiary. And at about 65.5 million years ago, the extinction of the dinosaurs is what's in the fossil record because below that line, all kinds of dinosaur fossils. Above that line, no dinosaur fossils. It's most likely caused by an asteroid hitting the Earth, and this caused the extinction because it was literally the worst day in the history of the Earth. There's a picture of the boundary. The white boundary is where the asteroid is. It's uh, designated by a whole lot of iridium. It's an element that's found a whole lot in asteroids, but not so much on Earth. And then the dark layer above it is the char from all the burning <laughs> that occurred. It really was a terrible day in the history of the Earth. On the left is how the Earth shook. It, was, uh, it hit in what is now the present-day Yucatan Peninsula, and it would have shaken all of the United States except for a little corner of Washington State up there. The one on the right with the gray is how far all of the stuff was blown out and landed elsewhere. So there are bits of what used to be in the Yucatan Peninsula as far north as Hudson Bay in Canada. That's kind of crazy. Plate tectonics is the fact that the Earth is a, or is not even, it has geologic features that the continents ride around. That's called plate tectonics or continental drift. They move about the speed of the growth of your fingernail. This helps, be, uh, this movement of plates helps species diversify because, uh, you know what, if you're on one side like this dude and his dog's on the other, uh, that dog's going to evolve independently of his owner's interest. A brief uh, sampling of what was going on with Pangaea, then you had two major continents of Laurasia and Gondwanaland, and then you started to break things up into what you could recognize as present day Earth. And that's it for section 10.1. All those topics are covered. Study hard for your quiz. Moving on to section 10.2, the origin of life. Evidence indicates that the sequence of chemical events preceded the origin of life on Earth and that all life has evolved continuously since that moment in time. Early theories were spontaneous generation, that life arises from non-life. Mice could be created by putting hay in a corner, or flies come from rotting meat. Francesco Redi in 1668 provided the definitive explanation that uh, hay Flies don't come from rotting meat. They're attracted to the smell of the rotting meat. They lay their eggs. You get maggots. Maggots turn, uh, metamorphosize into flies. He took some meat, put it into jars, left one set open. Uh, you got maggots all over the meat. He left one set closed. There were no flies inside that sealed container. And then you put cheesecloth on the top of one where the flies could smell it, but they couldn't land on it, so they laid their eggs. And the maggots were all on the top of the cheesecloth and not on the meat. So that's a pretty strong indicator that life does not come from non-life. That gives us the theory of biogenesis, which is literally life comes from life. And surprisingly, this was not fully accepted until the mid-1800s, mainly due to Louis Pasteur, who did an experiment where he put some broth uh, and he boiled it to kill anything in it, and then he let it set in this weird-looking glass container that allowed air to move in and out, but bacteria and other life forms could not get into it, and so there was no life. And then when he broke it off and let the air circulate more freely, and the bacteria could fall in off the air and, and off your skin and things like that, uh, then you got growth in the broth. Here's actual pictures of some of his experiments from the 1800s, excuse me, and there is no growth in there whatsoever. However, you will find sediment as all the nutrients in the broth in the 100 and some odd years since he set it up have fallen apart and decom not decomposed, but uh, degraded. And now they're at the bottom of that, and uh, I doubt it would taste very good. Modern theories to explain what happened because at some point we had no life, and then all of a sudden we had life. And you gotta break that gap, and that is through chemical evolution. 
And this is simply stating that simple chemicals combine into more complex chemicals. And then you develop some metabolic pathways and then you devise or invent the way to make more of yourself. That ties into the primordial soup hypothesis is that all the stuff spewing out from the volcanoes and being brought in by asteroids and water vapor gave you the building blocks of life. Although you had to assemble them to get actual life. Miller and Urey set up a proof of concept experiment uh, where they put all the different things in to a glass vessel and let it go. And there you can see a picture of the glass vessel now streaked with uh, complex amino acids. That is a video clip from Cosmos by Carl Sagan. And we don't have time to watch that. Here is another explainer of what's going on. So then we got to make some proteins. It appears, and there's some evidence to suggest, that these were bound to uh, areas rich in clay because they provide a good uh, substrate for the proteins to cling to. Reminder that RNA was the first coding system that was invented, and then DNA came later as a more secure copy of it. And you also had to make membranes. The first cells left no fossils, and again, we're back to the earliest fossils, about 3.5 billion years old. The earliest rocks that we can find the, uh, are about 3.5, excuse me, 3.8 billion years old. And the various chemical signatures in the rocks suggest life is present because it's different than what you would find in rocks without life. And that early life was linked to the volcanic environment. And here is an example of the oldest rock, which is the Acasta River area of Canada, and this sample has been dated at 4.03 billion years old. So rocks were being formed uh, 600 million years after Earth was considered to be formed. The first cells were definitely prokaryotes, and they were more than likely autotrophs, and chemoautotrophs at that. Why? Photosynthesis hadn't been invented, and you couldn't eat anything that wasn't already there. They live in extreme environments like hot springs and volcanic events. And are the archaea group of bacteria are the closest living relatives. You can find those in places where it's like it was on early Earth, really hot and no free oxygen. Great places might be Yellowstone or the thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. Photosynthi photosynthesizing prokaryotes did not arise until about 1.8 billion years ago, and this is called the oxygen revolution, because once uh, photosynthesis was invented by those dudes who built the stromatolites from last section, they're called cyanobacteria, then you could get uh, other life forms that could take advantage of the oxygen in the air. Once they released enough oxygen, they could form ozone, and then you could set up the ozone layer. You needed the ozone layer to help protect living things that were on land from the harmful UV rays. Here's another picture of living stromatolites, and I believe these are from Shark Bay, Australia. More about how cyanobacteria and where they evolved, because we had some questions a couple years ago. Uh, here is stromatolites from, looks like Highborn K, in the Bahamas, and then here are some in Western Australia. So there are some stromatolites in small pockets around the Earth. Remnants of these are uh, shown by the endosymbiont theory. Uh, there is no coincidence that eukaryotes appeared 1.8 billion years ago, and oxygen also appeared 1.8 billion years ago. Eukaryotes evolving is definitely tied to the amount of free oxygen in the atmosphere. The endosymbiont theory, <coughs> excuse me, as you remember, is that prokaryotes live inside in organelles. You, sorry, lived inside of eukaryotes, eventually became organelles, such as mitochondria, chloroplasts, and things called centrioles. And this was presented in 1967 by a Boston University biologist by the name of Lynn Margulis. There's a kind of a picture of those things being sorted in in mitochondria and in chloroplasts. Evidence for this is that they have their own DNA, they have ribosomes, they reproduce by fission. So it's one of the few organelles that can divide itself, much like bacteria would. That finishes up section 10.2, the origin of life, spontaneous generation, chemical evolution, the first genetic code, what were the first cells, what did cyanobacteria do, and what is this endosymbiont theory. So 
study hard for your quiz, and we will see you next time.